and border stuff. And this other one was supposed to be on food, and I'm coming in not as an expert. Most of you know more than I do. So I'm going to be giving you tools so that you can use these tools as organizers to work in whichever communities you're working in. It's going to get a little tiny bit technical, but I teach at San Diego State. Brad Warner, who teaches at Scripps, does the same stuff. We're working together. We can stay in touch with you through all kinds of organizations, faith-based communities, anarchist organizations, all kinds of networks that all of you already have. So I'm going to try to be uh, not too long so that we have plenty of time to talk. It does get a little bit technical, but the point is that this stuff is everywhere that I'm going to be talking to you about, and you can go online and find out all kinds of information. If you're way advanced, I hope you don't mind that I give examples, because I'm assuming that some of you will have never heard of some of the stuff I'm talking about. You'll have heard of the countries, border <coughs> issues, you're very familiar with that. So what I'm doing is relying on your familiarity with the pain in City Heights, the suffering, everything that we know that exists here, and I'm trying to link it to international issues and globalization. So if it gets a little bit tedious, just go with it, because through email, all the connections you already have, what Brad and I are trying to do is give tools in this community that can be developed to be more useful. So anything that doesn't seem to help, just don't worry about it, and uh, wait till I make the next point and see if that one is more helpful. The short title of this is Taco Bell, El Pollo Loco, Car Trunks, and a Green Truck. That's the short title. The more technical title is Fast Food, Slow Food, Food Trucks, and Smuggled Food in the Borderlands. A Complexity Theory Approach, Whole Wheat, Tortillas, and Golden Monkeys in China. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Golden Monkeys in China, their environment, how it can get messed up, and have you think about the little monkeys on the endangered species list and how they're suffering because of human interaction with the landscape and, and this local border and everything that you know about it and then give you these tools that you may or may not find helpful. So an example of a system, I'm going to talk about systems, is the Giju snub nose little golden monkey and how that little monkey is suffering right now because of the monkey habitat changes caused by tourism, gathering wood, and medicinal plants, and of course that's a good thing to gather medicinal plants, but this is the other part, illegal mining. So the illegal mining is messing with the environment. You've all heard of environments, I'm going to use system in a more specific way that has to do with complexity science. If you speak Spanish, how many of you do? I'm going to talk about a term that you can ask these Spanish speakers about later, which is red. R-E-D, and redes, networks. In Spanish, it sounds better, it's more inclusive, it's kind of like eating in a Spanish-speaking environment. Everybody's at the table, would you like more to eat? Who's ever eaten with Mexicans in a Spanish-speaking environment in Toronto, Latin America? So it's more of an assemblage, and that's a French word, and according to someone I'll talk about, if you think of it, you don't have to speak Spanish, but if you just think of a network that's reaching out to you, that's more what an assemblage is. I wrote a book called Border Writing, it's about how sad it is when you leave where you're from. How many of you are from the Bay Area and you're living down here now? How many of you miss the Bay Area? Anybody except me? All right. So, <laughs> but, uh, it's hard. But how many of you are here because you know we got to work here? It's hard, but we got to do it here. The pain is here. We're not part of the beast. So I'm going to talk about this, and for me it's very personal, but everybody in here comes from, a, how many of you have family members who speak a different language besides English? It's about everybody. You'll all relate to this. When one leaves one's country or place of origin, deterritorialization, everyday life changes, the objects that continually reminded one of the past are gone. The process of re-territorialization begins. And what I mean is you miss mole, you miss certain fruits, you miss certain pastries, you miss the way the sauce was made. You can't believe they mess up pasta that bad. What it, you never heard of them. What's wrong with you? And you get so sad. And it, it's a longing, a craving that you have. That's deterritorialization. So that's one long word that I'll be talking about. And it can happen when two countries are next to each other. You can be a guest worker in Europe and have this feeling. It can be inside your national boundaries. But deterritorialization is, for political reasons, for whatever reason, and it can be internal boundaries too. You end up in a place where you don't want to be, and you had to go there, and nobody asked you if it would be a fun, good idea for you to have to go live somewhere else, away from your family, your friends, your food, everything you love. And you don't get to share all the important events in your life because they're not there. All the people you, uh, who get it, it would make a big deal with you about it, they're not there, so oh well, you're just deterritorialized. And that wonderful word and concept comes from a dead 
white French guy named Gilles Deleuze, and he worked with someone who was anti-psychiatry named Felix Gattari, who has an Italian last name, but they stand in French because they live in France. The short time scale, they mispronounce it for that reason. The short time scale decision to leave one's country or place of origin leaves the memories, and we all know this. Who can remember the Bay Area? The personality. Oh, are you from the Bay Area? And the worldview intact. So you're the same person when you leave your country, your place of origin, your city, you're the same person. What you gotta change. You can't just go, I'm from Berkeley, I can't talk to you. You're not gonna have any friends, okay? In San Diego, it's a police state here. And so what are you gonna do? You can't just say, well, in the Bay Area, they do it like this. So you slowly start changing. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. And that's the other side of deterritorialization, which is re-territorialization. These are processes and they go together. So as individuals, they carry with them dynamics on numerous time scales. Now I'm getting technical, so this is the more technical language. I'll be talking about dynamics and complexity. From, and this is the easy part. This is a, a tort, who cooks in the food industry? Who's seen those little Russian cakes and they got all the layers? Okay, so I'm on the bottom layer. Numerous time scales, from fast scale stream of consciousness, how quickly you think all of your bodily processes that are happening in nanoseconds, that's the fastest time scale. Next to that, a stream of consciousness, and I'm going to move all the way to ancient, takes a long time, geomorph geomorphological time, how long it takes for mountain ranges to form, so you got to think like a geophysicist for this part, so think like you drank too much coffee for the first one, that's the faster time scales, the longer time scales, look at a mountain range, that's the in-between, that's a bargain basement way of talking about it, because it's a little more difficult, it has to do with reacting to something, and something called perturbations, but I'll get to that in a minute. So there are numerous time scales from the fast scale stream of consciousness to the slowly developing worldviews, re-territorialization begins. We can see this in the nostalgic longing for mole, a certain way of cooking. Spices available only in the country of origin are difficult to get. You gotta go to Vine Light, you gotta go to North County Produce. You have to grow it in your yard. Even if you have it, you forgot how to cook it. So that's the longing I'm talking about. When we miss home, we miss certain fruits, we miss smells, we miss flavors, we miss textures. Now, everybody, how many of you missed something that you used to eat and you loved it? All right. So now, the next concept is assemblages. It's not as boring as a network. That term gets misused, overused. So I'm talking about something a little different from a network. It's more like riding a bicycle. Who rides a bike? So when I get to the bike part, I want you, and I'm going to teach you something about teach. Oh, get over yourself. I'm not going to teach you anything. There's so much I don't know. You're going to teach me a lot during the discussion section, but I'm going to talk about something I barely understand, which is face space, and I'm going to do it in a bicycle way. So just get ready for buying some face space. Complex systems are often characterized by high dimensionality and hierarchical structure, and I'm going to get to dimensions and back to bikes in a second. Complexity is the property that the dynamics of a system can be characterized with multiple levels of description differentiated by time scales. That's how physicists talk, but I'm going to make it simple. You can imagine phase space and more than three dimensions. Who's got three? You can draw. Who can draw a cube? Artists, please help out. Okay. And the artists are going to tell you that it's so boring. If artists only thought in three dimensions, they would die of boredom. And so, yeah, they can only draw a cube. But artists think about, well, what if I wanted to think about more than three dimensions? I'm tired of the boring cube. Some of you are going, I can't even draw a star. But talk to artists and they'll explain. Cubes are cool, but they're only cubes. So now we're going to think about more dimensions. Think about a bike. A bicycle has 10 degrees of freedom. And I just want you to believe me and remember that it does. And I brought a little book and he explains it to you. This guy's Manuel de Landa. He came to teach, uh, to give a talk on the West Coast at Irvine. Not that many people went, but his stuff is very, very interesting in relation to this stuff. So now I'm going to talk about the Mexico-U.S. border. Everything I say, I'm going to come back over and over and say it more than once because I'm <laughs> slow and I need time on task. The Mexico-U.S. border is a complex system that can be described as a series of time scale separated levels, including, now I'm back to the different level, the, the Russian cake. At the fast time scales of minutes to hours by tracking documented and undocumented border crosses individually or in small groups, the individual legal and illegal goods crossing the border. Now I'm going to compare it to the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. You can go online and see these little kids. They're between 5 and 12. They're carrying 20 pounds, 30 pounds of illegal flour on their backs. And you probably wonder, isn't there an easier way to get flour? But there's not, and that's because of the drug war and getting rid of the poppies. And so people have to make a living somehow, so now they're carrying the flour illegally. And that's the only thing you have to understand for this whole little talk 
is kids are crossing the border. They don't want to. They'd rather just do something else. But they're living in a refugee camp. Their dad tells them, go cross the border. Their mom goes, oh, I don't want you to get hurt. Their little blisters, their little pathways, which you can see online on YouTube, are making it dangerous for them to do it, but they're not all going to get stopped. And activists can figure out and conceptualize why they won't all get stopped. Some food's going to get across the border. So the fast time scales, that's the little kids with their 20 to 30 pounds of flour on the back. Some cops, police people, border patrol people are going to get some of those kids. They can't hide the flour. It's not like strapping the drugs to your chest. They can't hide it. So profiling is, are you between 5 and 12 and do you have a bunch of flour on your back? Once somebody <laughs> sees you, okay, you're busted. You can't do anything with the flour. And you're only doing it because it's violence. Your dad's going to yell at you. Your mom's worried. The cops can beat you up, and they do. And you can see the interviews with the kids who have been beaten up. They've been beaten up because they didn't do it by their families and they wanted to sleep in that day. Or they've been beaten up by the cops just because, because they're an easy target. Now I'm going to compare, um, again, one more time everything I just said in a slightly more formal way. If we compare this region, Mexico-U.S. border, to the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, the first thing you have to know is these two countries share a border. The next thing, there are refugee camps where people who are ethnically Afghan, uh, uh, they have, that's their ethnicity, that they're trying to get stuff from one place into another place. So the illegal flour is now smuggled by children individually. They're, they might be working, walking together in a group, but sometimes somebody might fall behind. So they're not exactly protected. They don't have tanks protecting them. Individually on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, they are beaten by adults if they don't agree to cross with the flour. And why did this happen? And in complexity science, there's never an answer. There's no such thing as causality. So one of the many factors that shaped how the phase space went, and this occurred, after the eradication of poppy plants, that's what happened. The local population had to find new ways to survive. The eradication can be described in relation to intermediate time scales of years. So we've got the fast, fast, I drank too, much, too many lattes, that's the fastest, that's the Russian tort on the bottom. Intermediate time scales, that's years. And then the long time scales, how long for mountain ranges to form. An example of a border system and system boundaries. This part's hard. If this gets boring, don't worry, it's going to be fast. The Mexico US border system on longer and shorter time scales is what I'm doing now. The long time scales, this is the hardest part, but it's why you're here to you care about globalization. This is the part we have to theorize. At long time scales of decades and beyond, the border system becomes global. And that's the hard part to figure out. What happens when the border system becomes global? With evolving border ideologies interacting, and this is why the international relations people don't get it. If you're from one of those places, you know, I'm sorry, but they should invite me to talk, and I will explain to them why they don't get it. Because of nonlinearity. Ideologies interacting nonlinearly with globalization and the transformation of economic and political systems as occurred over the past few decades in China. So think about the little monkeys, think about all the changes in China, and think about this relationship there. No, one thing doesn't cause something else, but we have to think, and that's why the term systems is helpful. To some extent, the increased mining and the habitat in which the golden monkeys live in China is linked to globalization. Back to car trunks, because not everybody loves talking about globalization. Who is eaten from a taco truck, some kind of fast food, Mexican food, outside of a corporate setting? Who's eaten fresh tamales that are absolutely delicious and you ask, can I have the, the, yeah. So that's the one that's yummy, that got made by a human being in a kitchen that gets delivered to Golden Hill or wherever you live if you've had them before. That's going to be my good example of an alternative to Taco Bell or a Pollo Loco. So that those are the three choices we get. And I'm also going to talk about Green Truck because it's been on Oprah. You need to know about it. And I just ate the food. And it's really good. So. You're into all this stuff. It's not my area of specialization. Eat their food before you trash them. I don't know how they got on Oprah. I have no idea. But I ate their yummy food. They're in L.A. The food's healthy. They use fresh vegetables. They have a vegan and non-vegan uh, menu. It's available for catering events. And here's their motto. Healing our planet one meal at a time. That's for activists to look into and figure out if you trust them or not. But I did eat the food. I didn't die. And it was delicious. So Green Truck is an alternative to Taco Bell and El Pollo Loco. El Pollo Loco is yummy if you eat meat. Who's eaten there before? Okay. It came out of Mexico. Taco Bell didn't. If you, I hope you don't eat at Taco Bell, but if you've ever eaten there, 
you know what a homemade tortilla is, and you know what that little piece of garbage that they call a taco, you know. So, so I leave it to specialists in this area to figure out all of the nutritional reasons why there are differences that we could talk about. I can't talk about the nutrition, but I can ask you to think about how food gets distributed in the region from a complexity science approach. That's all I'm trying to do. How do people get fed? Because we all have to think about war zones, border zones, getting people fed in disaster areas, especially because Homeland Security wants everything here. So you're going to say, I want to plant flowers. Yes, but you need to do it in a Homeland Security way. So no matter how much you want to do what you want to do, can I just grow sage? As long as there are security implications, you're going to have to think about it because it's the only thing they want you to think about. So these are tools that anarchists and organizers and faith-based organizers, people from all different backgrounds and countries can use. Twelve tools to try to figure out how to think in terms of systems and I'm not going to say the word resistance or talk about resistance, but that's underlying all this. How do we resist without being control freaks, trying to decide in advance what we want to do, what we think should happen. This is going to argue we can't. Even if we had the right answer, we were good in math, and we had a chart, we still, and good resolution, and I had my laptop, and I had this on a PowerPoint. Even if we had that, from this perspective, we cannot predict. This messes up scientists' brain a lot. We cannot predict the future. So we can scold our friends and tell them what to eat and what to think, but from this perspective, these 12 tools should hopefully get you to think about, if you haven't already, that this doesn't cause that, there are non-linear relations that mess it all up, and we can't predict. That, that's what I'm going to be arguing about. Okay, dynamics. I teach in an English department. When I read this sentence, it makes no sense in terms of grammar, but this is how scientists speak. Okay, so I'm just going to read it. Don't correct the grammar. Just this, They don't even care about grammar. They care about something called dynamics. Dynamics is, shouldn't it be R? Ask a physicist. Dynamics is the specification of how a system changes from one configuration or state to another over a short period of time, interval of time. The dynamics of the pathway of undocumented people crossing the Mexico-U.S. border results in an incremental change in the pathway over a small time interval. You can learn as much as you want by taking any courses with Brad Werner at Scripps about that. You can go online and this stuff is everywhere. And it's in the State Department and International Relations. Complexity stuff is everywhere. The military uses it. It's all around us. That's why we need to think about it. Nonlinearity is the next concept. So I'm going to the next one. This is number two. Nonlinearity is a general flavor of dynamics with a number of subcategories all related to strong coupling including characterized by strongly interacting and strongly coupled elements. Coupled as linked, they're shaping, and the way to think about things being shaped, the little fish in their school, they're not waking up and deciding that the little fish school is going to go this way. They're just in there. The little birds, they're flying together. That's one way to begin to think about it, but just write down coupling if you're taking notes or remember that word, coupling. Now I'm to the next one, dissipation. Dissipation is a general flavor. This is the third category characterized by the tendency to reduce differences. This one's really easy. Who's crossed the border before and had to go to secondary? They don't care about you. But I'm a math major. I love the Ramones. They don't care. Who knows they don't care? They do not care. So dissipation is they don't care who your favorite band is if you can play bass. They truly are oblivious to your pain. Everyone in secondary is scared. Who's been scared in secondary? Who didn't remember to bring something? I had my kid with me. They grabbed my kid and I didn't have his papers. Oh my God. They've never seen a mad mom until they saw me. I screamed so loud they got scared. But that doesn't always happen. They can take whatever they want. They can do whatever they want. So dissipation is that everyone's scared shitless. When you're in secondary, you don't know what's going to happen. They can plant drugs on you. You don't know. So that's dissipation. Crossing the border reduces the differences. Everyone crossing at a certain point is going to be talking to someone who doesn't like you doesn't care what your SAT scores was, were, doesn't care about your dreams or future, it's their job to make you feel horrible and kind of scare you and make you just feel really bad and, and awful and make you wait until they decide what to do with you. Rendering them nearly indistinguishable prey, prey, when you're in secondary you are prey, being pursued by the border patrol, ICE, whatever you want to call it, the way they work together. So what in math and physics can help us think about how messed up that is, there's this thing, and now we're back to face space. The configuration of a system at a particular time, the system state, is characterized by a set of measurements stored as variables. Back to the border. Consider a border crossing. It might be characterized by the flux of people. Who's crossed the border before and you've waited in the line forever and ever? This is easy. Number per hour. Who's wonder which is the shortest line? Who's switched lanes before? Who's gotten mad at somebody switching lanes? That's all this is. Wait time for crossing. The number of customs agents actively questioning. Who's been questioned before? 
one of these guys he asked me who won the Nobel Prize in, uh, you know, you know Garcia Marquez, and I wanted to know if I knew that. I know that, let me through. And so, how long are they going to harass you at the border? Searching, how many people, how much does each search? Is it the search for secondary or the search in the line? All that. You can simulate that. You can write a program that can t take all that information into account. Most activists probably don't want to, but you could. So that's what that's about. That you can think about a border situation and food distribution and phase space all at the same time. Back to kids, if your brain's going like this. Children in Afghanistan crossing with illegal flour. There are boys, usually, between 5 and 12. They're crossing with the flour from Pakistan. They're beaten by the police when apprehended in some cases. One slept under a truck and was killed when the driver started the truck and didn't know that he was there. Not all are apprehended and they don't hide the flour. It's visible. So if you want to compare and contrast, drugs taped to you are visible once they pull up your t-shirt, but you could get through. How many of you know drugs do manage to get across the border to the side? Otherwise, Saturday night would be different in LA tonight, so uh, this weekend. So um, the, the using people are on this side of the border, and if you're not a drug user and you don't care about this, um, I just want to say this because it's really important. And I'm not going to mention who told me a lot of stuff about a local person from a country that's close to here and an ex-leader of that country. But this stuff comes up all the time. And it's in the paper today, but I'm not going to spell his name. It's the name of an animal, okay? Or it's in the paper between Thursday and now. But it had to do with drugs. It's so ridiculous. And I'll leave it to all of you. Of course we know the government puts drugs in poor neighborhoods and messes it up. No, we shouldn't be meth freaks. This is pretty clear. If you're going to be an organizer, you should know what day it is. However, the drug problem, as we all know, because we live in the middle of it, in the drug war, and we know about femicide and what is, the users are on this side of the border. So to punish Mexico or any other country that's not the United States, please. So um, using complexity to study children in Afghanistan, or you can just think about this side, this situation that we're in on this border. The number of police and border patrol agents actively ser uh, searching for children, crossing with flour, will have an impact on how many boys make it across safely with their illegal flour. In the same way that the number of people stopping people at the border, they're going to figure out how many people cross with drugs, who don't, the fast lane, the bribes, and all of that. If you bribe, and please, I don't suggest you do this, you have to be very wealthy to be engaged in this. If you bribe a border patrol officer, not in real life, but just theoretically, that's a two-way interaction because you're the Border Patrol guy, I've got my stuff, I need to get across, you can make it possible, we're negotiating. That's a two-way interaction and that's called a non-linear reaction. If you're selling tortillas, not whole wheat, I'm going to get to hybrids in a second, you have a fixed price. I can't try to change that price. That's a one-way interaction. So keep it straight with tortillas, one-way interaction, fixed price, and drugs, back and forth, corruption, that's two. Now back to time scales. Again, I'm telling you about time scales. The character, but this is the more technically correct way to look at them. The characteristic time for a uh, variable of a system to react to a small push. You get upset. How many of you, it takes 20 seconds and you're over it? Anyone like that in here? No, we're activists. That's fine. Now, how many of you hold a grudge for at least, yeah, messes up two or three meetings the next two days? So that's a perturbation. You've been messed with, something from outside upset you. It's going to take a while to get back into your little central, you know, the happy place. So the same for systems, a small push or pull. How long till you're not being a drag to be around? How long until the system goes back to where it was? That's called a perturbation. The fairly fast time scale of the process by which an undocumented purser, person or an Afghanistan boy smuggling flour decides to cross the border may be perturbed away, so that's how to remember what it means, by a relative arguing about the dangers of the journey. If your mom says, don't go to Tijuana tonight, and you're a 19-year-old guy, and you're going in your cool car, and you're kind of clueless because she sheltered you, I need to go. don't go, okay? So that's, that's mom saying, you're too clueless. You're, I grew up there, but you'll never make it back. That's your mom putting pressure. But it takes a while. Eventually, the guy wants to have fun or whatever. His girlfriend's there. Whatever the deal is, he is going to do what he wants. She's going to do what she wants. She wants to go see a cool film. Whoever it is, they're going to go. The amount of time that it takes is usually less than a day to a couple days. It's short, and that's the shorter time scale. Now I'm back to the boys in Afghanistan, and I'm sure a few girls try to do this. In relation to the boys in Afghanistan, a shift in policy in Pakistan resulted in not enough flour being legally allowed into Afghanistan. Many children of Afghan origin, origin live in these camps and smuggle not just flour but other drugs. That's why this works for activists to think about because drugs can become flour and as policies on longer time scales change, what's illegally going across the border is going to change. 
now degrees of freedom. Oh my god. 24. I have 10 more and we can still talk. Look at me and go shut up. I won't take I won't take up this. Degrees of freedom. Back to degrees of freedom. A pendulum. It goes back and forth. It has two things it can do. One is where it can move. That's called position. The other one, how fast, is called momentum. A bicycle has 10 degrees of freedom, and you all know this. If we consider all of us moving parts, handlebars, front wheels, crank, chain, rear, rear wheel assembly, and two pedals, that's 5 times 2 is 10. That's how it can move. Every time you think about phase space, just remember, it's either a pendulum or a bike, and you can get there. If you have a background in science, you're going, could you please hurry up? All right, each degree of freedom can be mapped as a dimension of a manifold. Hate math? Don't worry about it. But scientists can figure this out, and you could too if you just uh, choose to devote some time to it. Now, system boundaries. This is a little hard because we're not talking about the physical ground. We're talking about phase space. System boundaries. Border systems have boundaries, but these are open boundaries where material, information, and signals can cross. These boundaries may be spatial, geographical, or functional. The hardest thing in learning this is that we don't mean the physical border. We're talking about relationships that are connected to border regions, but it's not what you walk on. Next one is attractors. Border systems assume preferred configurations known as attractors. There's ton of stuff, uh, there's all kinds of stuff on the net about this, but if only it was so easy that you could learn the word attractor and talk about you're a fixed point, you're a limit cycle, you're chaotic. It doesn't work like that because that's a simple mathematical construction and we live in reality. We all know that unfortunately, if you're a master student, you can't just take math and put it on top of activism. It doesn't work. Next, transitions. A bifurcation, which some of you may have heard of, be heard of before. A bifurcation is a transition in a system state induced when alterations in the external environment lead to changes. So, a little village comes into contact with the global economy and things change. Who's from a smaller place? And you saw what happened wherever you're from. Do you want to, we were just talking about this. What would have happened if you didn't get the money to go to college? You would have gone to a junior college where you live. And somehow you got sucked into the globalized world through, in your case, it was just a group of activists and faith-based organizations. They helped you out. Who's from a, a small place? Anybody? That, not a major city? What, can you tell us? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you remember when it wasn't so developed and when it got more so, so gentrification is kind of a way to think about this, but but then mansions, it's got to be that really sucked in and then Taco Bell, it's, it's got to be that kind of thing as a way to start thinking about how you can be not part of the global economy and then you are. What happens, and I'll just give another example, what happens is appropriation of communal lands by corporate agriculture the timber gets taken out, there's exploitation. This can destabilize the population, causing it to rapidly decrease through increased mortality, migration, and all of that can lead to a bifurcation. I've talked about the levels of description ad nauseum, that's the Russian tort. Patterns and connections, I'm going to skip over that except for one thing, NAFTA. How many of you were against it? You knew it was not a good idea. You didn't need the Zapatistas to tell you, but you were happy that they did. Okay, so everybody knows about that example. The imposition that didn't emerge, people didn't say, let's have NAFTA. The imposition of NAFTA on the people of Mexico, that illustrates pattern initiation, development, and stabilization. Patterns and connections are very important. Uh, because what happened there was that there were mass numbers of economic refugees and the previous ways of living were no longer possible. Migration north resulted. See how easy it is? Now you're bored. Before it was weird, but now it's just like it. I get it. I get it. Initial refugees experiment, experimented and discovered new routes of travel. That's why the border <coughs> is going further and further and to more, the da to more dangerous areas in the desert. It's harder and harder to cross. And same thing back to Afghanistan, with getting rid of the poppies, heroin was no longer a possible trade. Hierarchies, um, I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to emergence because I want you to get to talk. Emergence is the development of a new longer time scale level of description. And this is when something new is created. The conclusion, I've talked about fast food, slow food, cooked at home food, sold out of the trunk food, and smuggled food. And tamales sold out of car. Complexity science provides tools for understanding food distribution in border regions, but complexity science cautions us as control freak activists regarding predictions. So it's very hard for us to know who should or shouldn't be in our collective, who got it straight or got it wrong, and what should or shouldn't happen. Thank you very much. Please talk. And please 
don't ask me questions. This is not my field. I'm in the complexity and the border part, and I work in Chicana and Chicana studies. But uh, I'm sure there are scientists here, and I'm sure there are all kinds of food activists who can answer the questions that other activists here can raise. So I'm coordinating the discussion by saying, you should talk. Well, I have a question for you. Um, so you have all this information. Um, is there a message that you're sending out? Like, what can we do with this information that you have? What I want to happen, but the hardest part about this is the more that I've learned about it, I'm a second generation anarchist and my uh, family was originally from the East Coast and then went to Berkeley and my uncle is Moe's of Moe's Books in Berkeley, a from the Bay Area. So I got born into anarchism. So the hardest thing for me is to shut up and not talk about how you should become an anarchist. That's just really like, pfft. so it fits with anarchism really well. It's all about self-organization and it feels like a nice fit. But if you're trained in the sciences, just because it feels warm fuzzy doesn't mean it's, you know, and, and the same with politics. So I got in trouble, I got interrogated at San Diego State because of anti-globalization and local activities. And many of you have been beaten up by the cops and all kinds of things have happened to all of us. And I'm quiet now. Even if I could say something, I assume that, as many of you, that, that and, but the good thing about being silent is it's probably a good idea for me to be quiet. So I would ask you, is there anything I said that suggested anything to you about what might be good to do in your current activities? Well, I mean, if there's, if there's like a non-linearity yes. to how all of this, the systems that you just described work, then what can we do about it? I mean, there's nothing we can do. Uh, I hate that part. I hate that. And I, I'm not a trained physicist, and I'm in the humanities. And when I found out, when I learned enough to ask that question, I just went, no, I don't want to know anymore. I want to go back to believing causality. I hate what you just said. Yeah, I hate what you just said. I really do. And I hope most of you, yeah, what he just said is the problem. I used to love Blumka. That's what they were saying to That's what's messed up. I guess, I guess for me, it's like, uh, with all that information, it's like whether whether or not we believe that there is causality, we can still do something about it and react directly to the thing that's most proximate, the, the thing that most recently happened to us. So, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if the causality or non-causality thing is working for me, but we can still react, right? I, I think forming assemblages, and so a machinic assemblage according to Deleuze and Gattari, could be anything, including you riding your bike, including a woman selling tamales out of her trunk, so we can form assemblages. That, that's kind of what we cannot really predict if we take this seriously. We can't predict because of those non-linear and linear. What you said. Someone else? Is there anyone forming assemblages and working in communities that would just like to talk about the cool stuff you do and get us happy? Because he just got <laughs> so sad. No, <laughs> you went right to the point. Is there anyone who knows that your life used to suck more before you got involved in trying to communicate with others and work and great things that make things like this possible. Yes. It's like, how do you like break down global businesses coming into small areas with cheap prices? Like, how do you just reverse that? Okay, I'm glad you asked that. I didn't want to talk about resistance, but I really think that buying from the trunk of the car, I am not saying that it can work for all the reasons we just talked about. But it's got to be going to Taco Bell and it's got to be supporting those. And I, somebody's going to say, well, you're just going back to a boycott. And I'm going to say yes in a way, but I'm also saying that we can sort of encourage new pathways in day space by doing certain things such as making our own, everything that's happening right here, this, today, this could cause little tiny shifts and we can't tell what's going to happen from that, but it could. So, do you want to add anything to what you think we should do? Uh, where do you live right now? You go to San Diego State? Oh, let's talk about our sucky school. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody from UC to have money and Harvard and Yale and Berkeley and everywhere else. Help us. Help us. We are in the heart of the beast. But we're so much more fun, and we didn't have that little Compton stuff, you guys. So, so we're, yeah, we're, we don't have all the money and the stuff, but there's some good stuff where we are because there are some weird kind of sense of community in certain parts of San Diego State. Chicago and Chicago Studies, Acha, for example. Do you want to add anything about this? Have you gone anywhere else, community colleges? Any other schools around here? We just hired somebody who just graduated from Berkeley, activist, anarchist, and <coughs> kind of studies. Yeah, yeah, I know. Monica Hernandez, Sunny Safe in the house. Okay. Anybody else who would like to talk about what you're doing to inspire us? There's a 
there's some people who just uh, are starting the San Diego Solidarity Network. It works really well um, in, in other cities, uh, especially in Seattle. And it's a, a way for people, if you've been, you know, if an employer hasn't paid you your wages or if you've been um, denied your deposit or something, the community organizes and goes and, and pickets this business or this person's house until they pay you. So it's a way to work outside of the legal system that doesn't serve the community and um, low-income communities and communities of color. So there, there are other ways to, to work outside of um, these systems that are community-based. That's a really cool one. And I'm just going to talk about it just because it fits so well with this. If you are going through a legal problem, you can't change the law, but you could go and get that kind of help. But otherwise, your little assemblage just, might just be, you're getting thrown out of your place where you live, and a few of your friends who don't have any money, they can't help you. So that's on that shorter time scale. That's the assemblage. On the intermediate time scales, the legal system. How are you going to link those up? And that's the coupling thing. And that exactly what you described. Those are the kinds of things we're going to do. Is anybody involved in law school right now? Or legal stuff or immigration law or anything like that? In here? Immigration advocacy. Immigration advocacy. Um, even though it's slightly different, the case you laid out, that's what immigration advocacy is about, right? And it's hard work because people are desperate. They want their papers. And it's very hard to say to someone, who's desperate, you know, it's going to take a really long time and this has to be filed and da 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 it's, it's not, people don't go, oh, thank God, you came from outside to save us. It, it It's extremely frustrating to do immigration work in this region because all the obvious reasons about the law, getting them on the law. Other people who want to talk about food, I'm sorry, everybody, that this is about food and we're talking about pastries. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a shameless promotion, but... Uh, Please, that's what we're doing. I think Bob Gottlieb, who is supposed to be speaking today, yes. uh, he's actually going to be at UCSD next weekend. Uh, we're having another food justice event there, and I have a whole bunch of flyers. Everyone should go, because it would have been so cool to have him come today, but if you're so disappointed, don't worry, because it's happening. Just he'll be, he'll be the, the keynote speaker at another food justice event. Uh, if you want some flyers, I'll put them on, on that Excellent. big thing right there. And, and also, this is for UCSD and UC people. I went to Berkeley and UCSD. And I teach at state. We have to work together. We've got different universities represented here. There's no way we can afford to not work together. It's so bad what's happening in the universities. So some of you teach, or you're grad students, or you hang out around students and they drive you nuts because they won't be quiet about whatever they're doing. They get it gets in the way of meetings. But whatever your relationship is to the local education industry here, it's really important to support these events. You might think oh, it was just one more event, but when we're there on campus. And there's no one who cares. We're so isolated. We need on campuses for you to come and just talk to us about anything. It doesn't matter. Golden bears, it makes no difference because we're starving out there. We're dying. Anybody else who wants to uh, Can you tell us anything that you've been looking like you might say something? Oh. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I've just been up. Called what? Alternative Breaks. Oh. Um, it's just, it's a it's a group of students come together to do trips during our spring breaks. Um, I want to tell everybody because they, they don't all travel during spring break. Okay. I know some of you, I'm sure in the past just got drunk during spring break. I don't know, but most of you are busy working 29 hours a day. But there's this thing called spring break. If you have a job, it doesn't matter. But if you're a student, it's called spring break. And if you don't drink and you don't just want to get wasted uh, or baked the whole week, you can go somewhere and do good environmental work. And that's what she's talking about. And so it's good to know about it if you're a student, that you don't have to just, oh, it's Saturday, I should get wasted. Oh, it's spring break, I should get wasted. But you could take that same time and do something that mattered. That's what she's talking about. And it's an opportunity to come back and be involved in your community here. And make ties here, yeah. which kind of goes back to what you said. It helps us imagine, I'm going to get Deleuze in a philosophical. Deleuze said that we should become animal, that even if we're born woman, that we should always, and we can do this with queer theory. Who loves queer theory more than the other stuff? Okay. So, you have more things to think about, more possibilities, and that's a, a way to organize, because we can connect with each other in different kinds of ways. The point I'm throwing out there. Are we supposed to leave? Oh my god. Um, I'm sure we're supposed to leave. Nobody said anything. Please talk in the back. Yeah, 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 yeah.
No, no. Please. So, bringing it back to the food, I think I was drawn because of uh, some of the stuff you were saying in the description. And I don't know about causality, but I know how my stomach feels when I eat those different things. So, to me, that's causality. If I eat Taco Bell, my stomach is going to react. And if I eat a, a, a mom that's in front of this market, my body's happy. My body tells me right away what is going on. So for me to keep eating things that make my body unhappy is self-hate. And in order, in order for me to, to practice self-love, I have to eat different things. And it's challenging. It's challenging. Like, that's why I come to these things. It's challenging to find ways to do that affordably and all of that. And, you know, I don't know about changing the whole system, but I don't want to back up my own gastrointestinal system. So, to me, that's that's pretty powerful in and of itself that our bodies talk to us, and so that's why food is so important, and the fact that all of these different things that are non-linear, that have happened over time, have caused us to be in a situation where we eat edible, non-food items in order to survive. So, I don't know, I just think that's really important. I'm switching for a second, because of what you just said. I didn't talk about indigenous knowledge and healing traditions, but that's the core of all this. That's why Brad and I are doing this. And so those are the two things I left out, but they're the point of it. I left out resistance, and I left out indigenous knowledge. But if the plants talk to you, you can grow them. There's all these things you can do to what you just said. Um, even though I think that the, um, even though you said that the uh, interactions between people are kind of uh, non-linear, I still think it's a, a sort of interaction uh, exchange. Even though there's no cause and effect, there's still like um, that kind of balance between each other, the opposite different forces. Uh, it's, it's the two kinds of processes together. Yeah, so it's together. On the shorter so, time scales, and a one-way interaction where you sell me something, you say how much it costs, and I hand it to you. There is that kind of linear causality. It's just that it has. But I'm still providing with you with the good. So you need something, and I need something as well. And that money, back and forth, goods. and that's the drug deal, and the, and the corruption, mm -hmm. and, the, and the border patrol guy would like some money. The drug dealer would like to get across the border without getting harassed, mm -hmm. and so that's the back and forth. Yeah. And so and I'm going to I'm going to connect it with a little bit more food, yeah. um, because um, our industry, our food industry, kind of you, you don't know where the food comes from. There's only so much that the label tells you. Um, they don't tell you the process of how it's made. They don't tell you. Uh, they don't tell you like where it's actually processed or the farmers that make it. And so, uh, and that's kind of strange. That's kind of weird to us because like we, we're putting this in our body it's only that's so intimate to us and so uh, one way to go around that is to demand that the food industries put better labels on our foods or the other way is to um, kind of support look uh, buy it from our community uh, uh, local farmers markets because that's the people who are actually making the food and so it's, uh, it's kind of combating that globalization because um, you know my food is packaged over in Ohio and I don't know who's doing it but if I buy it here it's kind of more like uh, we're building a community here and kind of uh, the idea of resistance against the uh, like kind of globalization factor. And is globalization, globalization good for your health? That's like the other good question. Too. Right. And you would say no, right? Globalization is not good for our health. Well, I'll give the business school answer. I teach at a party school with a good business school. The business school answer is don't you want your pork chops with a little wrapping and that you can have them frozen in case you need to have pork chops 3,000 years from now? You have to plan ahead. Okay. You're right. I'll be a business major and I'll eat pork chops that are frozen. But what about like free trade coffee? I mean, yeah, 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 please, please, please. But that's, I mean, is that is that another side, maybe a positive side of globalization? Yeah, because we wouldn't be drinking coffee right now. I'm just saying, is it? What, what would you say? What would you say about it? For free trade coffee? I don't. I know I love coffee, and I know, like, I know I don't want to stop drinking coffee, and so I, I, I don't really know. You know, like, I don't feel like I have an answer as to whether whether this is a good thing or if there's a if there's a positive way to to use goods that come from the other side of the world, or not, that's the but maybe there is. That's the hardest part of this. Ecotourism is another one, and even the good spring break, <laughs> even that, and even any kind of development work, and if you're UN types in here, policy people, international relations, all the good work that's being done, there's somebody sitting there not doing anything except checking out the list. What loser? Gay, lesbian, bisexual, HIV positive, um, marginalized white guy did I get to sucker in to do all this work for free, thinking that it was, you know, okay. And so somebody's got an agenda and is making, that's the very complex, difficult, frustrating part of all this. I'm sure we're not supposed to be in here anymore. So tell so me. Yeah. You have 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Please, I don't want you to feel trapped. All the people who need to leave, because I know that we're way over our time. Um, thank you everybody for coming so much.
And if you want to learn more about this, I can give you my email. And Brad, he's not here. I thought he would be. Oh, here he is. Okay. I'm so glad. Brad, don't leave. Uh, Brad, please come here. <laughs> Brad, where I can tell you everything about this because that's where I got this information from. Thank you very much.